Welcome to My Therapist Says, an interactive experience enriching your most important relationships. I'll be your host and moderator as we present Caring for Aging Parents. During this broadcast, I'm joined by Dr. Frank Ogle, licensed marriage and family therapist and a full-time specialist serving Sharp Mesa Vista Hospital's Gerontology Senior Unit. Caring for aging parents is a complex and taxing effort. Many of today's adults are doing their best to care for their children while at the same time caring for aging parents. This is a challenging task which can take its toll on emotion, physical health, and spiritual well-being. Dr. Ogle and I will help you explore this challenging issue. Today's event takes place before a live audience and live streaming while offering practical biblical solutions. It's like having your own Christian mental health relationship doctor within the comforts of your living room. I hope you will sit back, relax, and take in these life-changing insights. Please join me as we connect with a live audience and my therapist says. Well, Dr. Frank Ogle, we welcome you. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Frank Ogle as he brings our presentation this evening? Thank you very much. And uh, I, I want to recognize another special person. That's my wife back here, who's always so supportive. And uh, our, we commented the other day, um, we, we watch some marriages that kind of degrade over time, and ours just keep getting better and better. So it's nice to have her with me tonight. Uh, this is my second time doing, my therapist says, and I was thinking uh, earlier today that I get a distinct pleasure. I don't know if you thought of this, but I get to do the first, my therapist says, of the new decade in 2020. Yes. I don't know what kind of award I'm going to be getting for that, but <laughs> maybe something will come my way. Um, in this uh, presentation tonight, I, I, I'm going to have to go over some of these slides briefly, but you do have the handouts that you can uh, refresh uh, later on. Um, I have been at Sharp uh, Mesa Vista Hospital for a little over four years working in the senior intensive outpatient department. And in my group today I had ages from 63 to 90 years old. So I have quite a spread and uh, I think maybe some insights that I can share with you today. Part of the overview as you can see here is caring for our aging parents what might come up. And I think a big component of caring for our aging parents is caring for the caregiver. And I've seen over the years so many caregivers burn out, whether it's caring for somebody that's aging or chronic illness or somebody, a family member with PTSD. And so uh, we want to look at coping with caregiving the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that go with that, and some tips and tools for increasing your well-being, and then resources. And out on the table tonight, I have various uh, pamphlets and handouts uh, for you. Quite a number of them from the Alzheimer's Association. Once a month I go and they offer a memory screening on the third Thursday of each month. And so I gather quite a bit of information from them. So there's some good resources. And I think in your packet, I had um, put together some uh, resources that uh, can be helpful. So some of the issues that our seniors face, life transitions, some of this can be change of residence. Uh, death of a spouse. Many of my folks have had a number of their number of them. Their spouse has passed away. Uh, one gentleman commented uh, just yesterday. In the past month, he's had a couple of cousins and close friends who have died. And so, this is a difficult transition for people. Uh, mobility issues. Um, I've seen some of the best and strongest curse their walkers. So needing to use a cane or walker, wheelchair, or losing their driving privileges. 
and then mounting medical issues and concerns around that, and then certainly uh, memory problems. You don't have to be a senior to start having memory problems. Let's have a show of hands. How many of you have gone into the kitchen <clears throat> and then stop and go, <laughs> thank you, that's what I thought. <laughs> I know, I've watched me do it many times uh, on a daily basis. Some of the memory things are a natural part of aging. There's a handout out there called, is it uh, uh, depression or dementia? So some of the common tasks of the caregivers may be uh, helping to buy uh, groceries, cooking, helping to tidy up in the house, doing the laundry, providing transportation. Um, helping uh, the parent or the care receiver to get dressed or bathed, uh, taking the medications in a timely manner. A um, big one is arranging uh, medical appointments and uh, arranging the transportation for them to get there. Um, communicating with doctors and nurses. Oftentimes a senior will go to a medical appointment. Well, what did the doctor say? Um, and maybe they remember a half of it. Uh, handling finances and other legal matters. And for some, they end up being on call 24-7. So <clears throat> we have um, uh, the impact on work, employment for the caregiver. Many, uh, one in six Americans working full or part time. Uh, need to rearrange their work schedule. And 61% of those uh, experience at least one change in their employment status, either needing to cut back or take uh, early, uh, early retirement. And um, those uh, who are caring for those with uh, diagnosis of dementia, 17% uh, of them quit their jobs uh, soon after or before that diagnosis is given. And then nearly 70% of working caregivers caring for a family member or a friend report that they've had to rearrange their work schedule. I need to take off time, uh, take off a little bit earlier. And I think what needs to be said is a big thank you to caregivers. You deserve a, a big thank you. It's well deserved. Oftentimes, you are the unsung heroes. Uh, and actually, the, the savings <clears throat> that it provides in the economy is enormous. Um, and you get very little for it oftentimes. And so let's take a, a look at the impact of caregiving uh, and ways to care for you. So one is to identify yourself as a caregiver. That may seem obvious, but I am providing care for my loved one. And really to get a good understanding of the diagnosis of what your loved one's going through. I think a lot of times it's a bit of a mystery or a family member won't want to share. Uh, we just had to give the unfortunate diagnosis to one of the men in my group that um, his depression and forgetfulness was not so much about depression, but the early stages of depression in this, or of uh, dementia. And this was a, a pretty hard pill for them to take. And so we want to make sure that people understand what their uh, diagnosis is. And then, <clears throat> How many of us know how to care for somebody with maybe a chronic health condition, dementia, or who are in the dying phase? My mother and I took care of my father as he was dying. Our intentions were good, but to be quite honest, in spite of all of my education, I didn't know how to care for a dying person. And we needed extra help to come in with that. Um, complete legal uh, paperwork, get powers of attorney. If you have other family, bring them together and have a heart-to-heart -heart discussion 
on uh, what your resources are, what their resources are, and those in the community. Uh, and then next, there's the impact that, ca that this can have on the, on the health of the caregiver. And I've seen this quite frequently, increased rates of depression, uh, anxiety, uh, self-medicating to relieve these through alcohol use or other substances, uh, chronic illness can crop up, um, a lot of frustration because life is just totally turned on its head. Um, kind of feeling a loss of, in fact, I've heard a few people say, I don't know who I am anymore. You know, I am, I am, uh, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be this nurse or something, and I, I really don't know who I am anymore. And then not feeling like I'm doing a good job, so my self-esteem goes out the window. Um, uh, increase for heart disease and lower immune uh, functioning. So, <clears throat> when we are on the flight and the stewardess comes up and says, in case of an emergency and your air mask comes down, forget your kid. <laughs> no, they don't say that. They say, first put the mask on yourself and then put the mask on your child. Why do they say that? Because by the time you get the mask on your child, with that lack of air, you're most likely going to pass out and die. So they instruct you, first, take care of yourself, then you can take care of your family member. And that's what this picture is all about. So. If any of you are caregiving or know somebody that is, um, recognize some of the signs of stress. And remember that you cannot, you will not do this job perfectly. And you have a right to all of your emotions, the love, the frustration, the anger. And depression is a very common emotion for caregivers. And so learn about the disease and know what to expect. And that could be um, anything from what to expect from if somebody has Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis or chronic heart disease. And then learn to say no to the things you cannot do. It is okay to say no. And let me see what I can find out. Uh, get plenty of sleep. It's essential. And monitor any of your feelings if you're beginning to feel burned out. And then next we have um, practicing self-care. So what is self-care? It's the implement imp oh, implementation mm -hmm of daily actions to attend to one's physical, mental, and emotional well-being, your mind, your body, and your soul wellness. So there are some barriers to self-care. Resources, maybe you feel like you don't have the t money, the time, maybe unhelpful coping habits, things like uh, withdrawing and isolating and having inaccurate thoughts. Taking a look at our thoughts can often impact how we feel about, uh, how we feel, um, and sometimes it can be helpful to record what your, what your thoughts are. You know, it's one thing to read the verse, take all of our thoughts captive to Christ. Okay, I'm not going to think dirty language. I'm not going to think lustfully. And gosh, I'm such a horrible person because I can't take care of mom and dad. And I'm worthless and I'm hopeless. And those are also thoughts that we need to be mindful about. So here it's just a little diagram of uh, cognitive behavioral approach that we often use at the hospital that uh, thoughts influence how we feel and how we behave. Behaviors influence how we think 
and how we feel, and of course how we feel influences those other two areas. And so, <coughs> so some of the, the thoughts that can come up, inaccurate thought is, um, his illness is getting worse, I have to be there for him, and I don't have time for anything else, I have to take care of him, I don't have a choice. Or, this is a bad and unexpected thing. Now, I've been through bad things before, and I'm working on getting through this. So it's not denying the fact that the situation is bad or unfortunate, but it also changes some of the black and white thinking that is in that first thought. So, in managing the role changes, you may feel frustrated, probably will, may even feel hopeless, fearful, angry at the situation. I talked to the lady, the wife of the man that we told um, probably has dementia, and I talked to her on the phone to see how she was doing, and she said, I wasn't prepared for this. It's sort of like this wasn't our retirement plan. And so may not have been your plan to be a 24-7 caretaker, and you get angry, and then you feel guilty about feeling angry. And so when we feel bad, we often do less, and as we do less, we feel worse, and then we do even less. And one of the things that we find very helpful, we call it behavioral activation. It means do the opposite of what depression or hopelessness tells you, and that is to do something, and you feel a little bit better. Do a little more and feel even better. And so we look at <clears throat> being mindful of what we're, what we're feeling. So mindfulness is a buzzword today. It's been on in front of Time Magazine. And basically, what I equate it to is being aware. And if we look at our gentleman walking his dog here, his mind is full of all kinds of stuff. It's here, it's there. What did I got to do tomorrow? Oh, I didn't do something yesterday. And what is the dog doing? The dog's enjoying the walk. And I think as, as Christians, that's something that we're instructed to do, is to be present in the moment. Tomorrow has enough worries. So some meditation, um, reading, finding pleasurable activities, uh, practicing some self-compassion, maybe taking a little extra time for yourself and organize your mind. And then we have, uh, what do we have? There we go. Good, good definition. Mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. And what that means is you're not going to do things perfect. You're not going to think things perfect. But don't judge yourself. Be aware of the moment that you're in. So some of the tips for handling this is find somebody that you trust, a friend, maybe somebody here at church, and then set realistic goals for what you can really do about their needs. And don't forget about yourself because you feel like you have to be too busy. And then um, <clears throat> there's times when you need to give a professional a call to just talk through and get some extra support. Um, and so here's some of the local supports that um, I've gathered and I've interacted with some of them. Uh, Southern Caregiver Resource Seven, uh, Center. Um, and they can provide consultation. And the important one is the second one there, the respite care, uh, short-term counseling, some legal uh, consultations, support groups. Next we have, um, oh, JFS, Jewish Family Services. And no, we don't have to be Jewish. Uh, they, the Jewish Family Services has really uh, reached out to the seniors in our community, provides some fantastic services, everything from support group. They have on-the-go transportation services, so senior can sign up for that. 
reserve or ride. Basically, <coughs> the cost is on a donation basis. The Alzheimer's Initiative, Aging Life Care. And then they have a couple really great uh, social and wellness centers. They're um, location actually pretty close to College Avenue Baptist on College Avenue and then they have one up on uh, Balboa Avenue that also has a, a bit for those with uh, dementia and then elder help they have home share where people can uh, rent out a room in their uh, in their home and seniors a go-go also a transportation service. And then one that we use a lot is the geriatric specialist at Douglas Young Wellness Center. And uh, this is somebody that can come out short term, talk to you, your family, see what some of the needs are, and provide some resources. And then of course the Alzheimer's Association, if you're working with a loved one who has uh, dementia, Alzheimer's. Uh, they have uh, just an incredible amount of classes, support, and resources that can be given. And then um, where I work, um, I work at Chart Mesa Vista Hospital. We have our senior intensive outpatient program. It's where people come for three days a week. We have uh, three groups each of those days. It's intensive because it is three days a week, nine groups over those three days. We do provide a complimentary lunch and in certain areas we uh, provide uh, complimentary uh, transportation. And on our team, our team's made up of uh, nurses, uh, we have different psychiatrists, and then a therapist, and then we kind of determine uh, what group, we have five different groups, and um, we kind of determine uh, which group would best set the, uh, the needs of the senior. And so if you have any questions, or um, you know, if you or a loved one may be um, uh, able to benefit from this. Uh, this is our number to our outpatient access services. I'm not here to do a commercial for Sharp, but I waited a long time to get a job there because I think they really offer uh, some really great services in the mental health area. So I think that wraps up my portion. Wonderful. Can I go home? No. I'm not. You're ready to go. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Join me, if you would, in thanking Dr. Frank Ogle for his presentation. And again, you do have a three by five card. Some people may be texting their questions, but just hold it up in the air, and, and one of our hosts will, will, will retrieve that and receive it from you and bring it to the front. So if you have your question written out, please feel free to just hold it in the air. Your questions will be very important to us uh, this evening. I'd like for us to start, if we could, then, as those questions are coming. Uh, Dr. Ogle, as you, this is a specialty of yours, you begin to talk about the anxiety of the, the, the caregiver, the health care giver, and the anxiety, uh, the chronic illness that can take place in the person, their self-esteem plummets, potentially, even heart disease, lower immune efficiency. These were some of the things that you described. Help us to understand a bit from the biological issue or area how does this happen? Yeah, we're just we're going about our daily uh, rigors of trying to help a, a loved one, someone we love. Of course, we know it's 24-7. We're not meant to do that. But could you help us understand what is happening to that person when they are caring for a loved one and maybe they're going above and beyond what they're capable of doing, which you mentioned about your own father, I believe. Um, what is, what's happening to the person when they are really over, kind of over-functioning in this? Well, how many of you, when you get stressed or anxious, maybe feel a little tension in your stomach? Or how about up in your shoulders? A little tightness, a little tightness in your breath. This is our body responding to, to stress. Now, a little bit of stress is, is all right, but I think when people undergo uh, uh, 
kind of a long-term chronic stress, our body begins to take the impact, and it does begin to uh, affect our immune system, our ability to um, ward off even the common cold. I've seen people talk about they, they tend to get sick more often, bronchitis more, and then the stress just even on the heart. One of the things that happens is sleep really gets impacted. Uh, they become anxious, they're worried. Um, you know, I, I know when my mom and I took care of my dad, um, he received that diagnosis of cancer and started chemotherapy. And the initial shock of that, it just turns your world upside down. And we cared for him all along the way, and his wish was to die at home, which he ended up doing. A um, little comment on that. I don't know that that was the best decision on our part. Um, for one thing, uh, the stress that I saw that it took on my mother was enormous, and I was staying with them at the time. But then also, we're not, we're not geriatric nurses. Mm. Mm. And so we're trying to do things to be helpful and never quite sure, am I quite doing the right thing? So that really raised a lot of stress. And of course, that impacts our sleep. When it impacts our sleep, our, our sleep is so vital to the to kind of the restoration of our body, our immune system, uh, our ability to tolerate frustration, uh, different elements of mood, the depression, anxiety. Um, and over time, uh, people, they, they can become very frustrated with this you know, never get better. And that's where that downward cycle in the thoughts of, well, this is never going to get better. And the truth is, sometimes it's not. So how do we care for ourselves even when something isn't going to get better? And I think, you know, these were some of the suggestions tonight. I think some of the resources in the community, the respite care can be, can be a very big key thing. So say um, I'm caring for a family member and I've never really had a lot of stress in my life, yet now all of a sudden apparently I am having stress but I'm not aware of it. How could I uh, discern if I am experiencing a lot of stress? So you talked about your shoulders maybe getting tight. What would be some somatic or body awareness that would help someone to realize, oh my, I didn't realize I'm really holding this stress in, in, in my body, as some of the somatic medical doctors will suggest that we carry that, what tells you that, that you're stressed? And I mean, we, we know when our heart goes up, we're stressed. We've all been in stressful situations, but we're talking more of chronic stress, yes. that it never quite ends well. It, it will eventually end, but it's, it's night and day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that aspect of, of being mindful, of being aware, um, I don't think our culture actually um, really cultivates self-awareness very much, mm -hmm. um, as evidenced by how often do you see people out and at the restaurant and they're on their phones or they're watching things, and and so we're we're often externally distracted. And I, I think really being mindful, being aware, um, noticing what are some of the changes that I'm seeing. So that could be some of the things. I, I asked the folks in my group, when you feel anxious, mm -hmm. where do you feel it in your body? So when we do a little survey, you, people at home won't be able to see this. but. Don't be shy. When you feel anxious, where do you feel it in your body? Is it up here? Back here? Oh, my wife's going up, back of my head. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
I often, if I'm really stressed and anxious, I tend to feel it down here okay. and up in my shoulders. So um, beginning to notice when, some, when my body is telling me that I'm stressed. Um, when am I feeling depressed? Mm -hmm. A lot of times people say, well, I just feel kind of a heaviness mm -hmm. right here in my chest. This is our body. I think this is a God-given gift to us. Our body is saying, you're not feeling good. You're feeling heavy or you're feeling tight. Mm -hmm. and, and so to be able to then respond in an opposite way. Typical ways of responding to, to uh, depression or anxiety is a gradual withdrawal. Oh, your good friend called you. She's asking you to call her back. Well, I just don't. I'll get to it later. And later never comes. Mm. So some signs of withdrawal. Um, avoiding things that we used to enjoy. Uh, ha having a, a loss of interest in things that we used to really enjoy. Uh, particularly in with depression, uh, people will typically lose things that they typically enjoy. So let's say if Saturday morning you enjoy a cup of hot coffee and or tea and and like reading something, you won't have that cup of coffee. You won't mm -hmm. you won't sit down and read your favorite book or the paper or the news. So these are little signs that the mood is starting to take prominence. Mm -hmm. It's the temptation to, to really want to be God to someone, to be there 24-7, to be there for them, when actually we are told the first commandment not to have any other gods before us, and we do need rest, and we need relaxation. So one of the things I'm hearing you say, Dr. Ogola, is that it's important for us to maybe continue to do things and behaviors that we've done before. You used the word behavioral activ act activation. activation yes. And that is to do something that, that feels different from what you feel like you should be doing. So that is maybe answering the phone. Mm -hmm. that, that good friend that called. Mm -hmm. Maybe answering the phone even though I don't necessarily feel like doing that. So the worst thing for us is to go to an isolatory behavior because Very we're meant much. to be in relationship. Right. The Bible right. talks clearly about that. So one of the ways is actually sitting maybe as you suggested and notice where your body's tight. You know, it could be just in your calf. It could, it could be in your arms, your shoulder, like you said. It could be your jaw where it is for a lot of people. So one of the things is just to make sure that you're taking time to be aware and then to take time to relax that. Good deep breathing, which you hear a lot of therapists talk about, can be very helpful. You, you, you read my mind. Okay, yes, because even like you said, if it's resting here, what, what's happening here is your esophagus, your whole neck can be tightening, and so just good deep breathing can begin to relax that, that area, and actually your shoulders will relax if you're deep breathing where you're at. You're, you're letting your diaphragm drop, it's diaphragmically breathing, can be very helpful. Well, that helps us to start as we begin this, this evening with all of this, there, there's a question that was raised here by a person, and we do welcome your questions. So feel free to raise your hand with your three by five card with your question. Is my mom has Alzheimer's and regularly wants to um, pick up and leave, it sounds like. She has only been married eight years and her husband doesn't know how to handle this situation. So he calls me and I talk to her. Do you have tips for him because he gets very frustrated. She probably has something on her mind that um, goes to the past. One of the things about uh, uh, dementia due to Alzheimer's is uh, recent memory begins to, to go. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I remember a story uh, related to me. Uh, Somebody's mother had uh, Alzheimer's, and she kept talking about, I don't know, Fred. Hmm. What, what a nice guy Fred was. And they're going, who, who on earth is Fred? Hmm. Well, through a little digging and asking and what have you, they, the uh, 
discovered that Fred had been their milkman mm. many years ago. Mm. And that's who mom was talking about, mm. was Fred the milkman mm. from a long time ago. And so she might be thinking about um, something that she needs to do. So I would maybe look at some sort of conversational way to be with her. You know, um, they begin to get into kind of a, a, a different reality. Um, <clears throat> my, uh, one of my best friends, his father had, al had Alzheimer's. A uh, very accomplished man, CEO, ran major companies, and there at the end, they uh, ended up uh, full-time home care for him. And the caretaker, uh, they had um, a nice walk-in pantry. And so uh, my friend's father, named Finley, uh, she hears Finley in the pantry talking. Mm. She, Finley, who are you talking to? He probably points to a can of beans or something. He says, well, I'm talking to my friend right here. Duh. And she just said, okay, just so I know who's in the house. And left it there. Yeah. Now, probably within a half a minute, Finley wandered somewhere else and, and um, didn't even remember that. A week or two later, he's in the garage. She hears him talking again. Finley, who are you talking to? Probably pointed to a rake this time. Well, I'm talking to our neighbor here. Okay, just so I know who, who you're talking to. Because when we t try to get into a little tug of war mm, mm. in terms of what we know to be reality and what they think they're experiencing becomes... Um, well, it, it's a no-win situation. Um, one of my students shared a story, because uh, I also uh, teach a psych class, and um, family was all together for Thanksgiving dinner, and grandma was there, and grandmother had dementia, and she said, well, we need to wait for Ted. Ted was her husband. Mm -hmm. And one of the kids piped up, and in all innocence said, well, Grandma, you know Grandpa died last year. Mm -hmm. Well, river of tears. No, mm -hmm. she did not know that. Got things settled down next year. Another big family meal. Same thing. She says, well, we got to... We got to wait for Ted. We can't start dinner without Ted. <laughs> they learned their lesson. Mm -hmm. One of them piped up and said, "Oh, he went out with little Timmy while he's practicing basketball. Why don't we go ahead and start?" Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So we need to look at what what is it that she wants to leave to. Try to find out, and then try to be flexible in the conversation. And, um, hmm. you know, we kind of have to maneuver the truth a little bit sometimes. But in, in all honesty, they're, they're probably going to lose a bit of track. I think I have a little brochure. I didn't have many, but uh, you can go online to the Alzheimer's Association about wandering, Alzheimer's and wandering. Hmm. You know, that's a real a real danger, because they'll just get up and go. Yeah. And you hear, the, you hear the police helicopters every once in a while? We're looking for Mr. Smith, 75-year-old mm -hmm. man wearing blue pajamas. Mm -hmm. He's a dementia patient. You know, every once in a while you hear good news mm -hmm. that they find him. Every once in a while you've, they find him dead in a ravine somewhere. So, you know, wandering is... A, you know, this may be a beginning uh, indicator that she just might wander, and then you need to secure the house so that she doesn't just kind of wander off. So part of it is not moving into a tug of war, like you know, right. the, no, no, he's he passed away, you know that, and we want to tell the truth, of course. What would be some other languaging, not to tug, of, you know, not the tug of war concept? but a little bit of deterrent, like, 
without te telling a lie or telling yeah. a fib. What, what would be some other language, like when that was happening there, what else could they have said that he's not here, but you don't, that would be the tug of war. We're not yeah. wanting to get back into that. Yeah. Well, you know, why don't, um, I'm not sure exactly where he's at. Um, so why don't we go ahead and get started, and we'll, we'll serve up a plate for him when he, when he gets here. Okay, something like that. Yeah. Yes, what, what probably is very difficult about this, at least with patients with whom I've been privileged to work, is that immediately when the, the other person says, you know, well, where's dad? And of course, dad's deceased, and the person is not sure really what they're asking, is it raises a lot of anxiety in the person's hearing that because that was my dad or, you know, that's, that's my uncle. And then you're having to tolerate your own anxiety that, right. you know, please right. don't say that. And you're having to tolerate that at the same time, try to be very caring and loving for the person who is challenged mm -hmm. for memory. Yes, yeah. And that's what one of the li uh, slides was referring to is really acknowledging your feelings. Uh, you know, one of my past clients, she went to visit her mother up in a um, facility up in uh, Oregon, and uh, she sat down uh, with her brothers and sisters mm -hmm. at the table at the residence where mom was at and to have lunch, and, and uh, her mom looked around and the client was sitting right there, and mm -hmm. she goes, well, where's Betty? Is she dead? Mm. And, mm. you know, it was very hard for my client oh, to yeah. hear that. Sure. And it's the, the, the natural response is to feel, to take it kind of personally. Mm -hmm. Well, don't they know me anymore? Well, the nature of the disease is, no, they don't. Now, there can be little, little kind of bright moments when they may recall. Mm -hmm. somebody mm -hmm. but that can really fade in and out so right at that moment this, this happens so often to people what you just described and I think that's why you shared it Dr. Ogle, Ogle is that what do you do at that moment when that happens and all of a sudden I feel completely sad I thought I was going to come and visit my mother you know and I thought she might be having one of those bright days and of course she doesn't know who I am mm -hmm. how do you immediately deal with that sadness so I'm the one with the sadness because I'm wanting my mother to recognize that I'm here but she's waiting for him my, me to come in mm -hmm. and I'm here but well I mean it could be to just say oh it's okay mom I'm I'm right here uh -huh. maybe you just didn't recognize me and they still might be who are you yeah. you know and if that's it then just say, well, um, I'm told I look. You, you can always just downplay it. And I think a key thing for the family member, this is a disease. This, your loved one is not the disease. Mm -hmm. Your loved one is not the disease. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And something like dementia, and I know this comes up for a lot of people's concern, is when a person progresses through dementia, they are not the disease. And so to hold on to the memory of who they really are. And um, I think that is the most beneficial for you and for your loved one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very well said. So this next question relates really to what you have been talking about in that at what point do memory problems require intervention? You talked earlier this evening about that sometimes we'll try to do too much. We'll, we'll try to do beyond what we are capable of accomplishing. And at this point, this particular question raised is at what point do memory problems require intervention? Well, like I said, we all uh, walk into the kitchen and, and uh, forget why we went in there, and maybe even two or three times, if you've ever watched me go into the kitchen. I think... I um, haven't, but I just want you to know, I've not seen you go into the kitchen. But. Okay, um, <laughs> but uh, you might... His office right across from mine. Uh, I've seen you go into your office. <laughs> and I've gone in there probably and go, what did I go in here for? Um, the... So, 
let's say somebody who's driving. Now, I have driven to a place, and I'm going to assume you have too. You pull into your driveway, you turn the car off, and you go, how did I get here? Mm. All right, thank you. Your, your honesty. Uh, we have one person that's laughing. Okay, <laughs> yeah, so at least yeah. one. Okay. And the rest are too ashamed to be honest, right? Um, no, no, you know, we get, we get sidetracked and we get sure. thinking. And I, sure. I've even thought, oh my goodness, did I really stop at the stop sign? I hope so. Yes. The answer is yes, we did. We do things out of rote memory. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's even times when I've been driving somewhere and my mind is so intent on something else. And then when do you notice that your turn is you missed your turn when it's right there, right? And I go, really? And I go around and I get back on the track. So even something like that would be a normal event. I think when somebody drives to their local market, to their Vons they've been driving to for the last 10 years, and on the way back home, they get turned around and, and they have extra difficulty finding their way back. Mm -hmm. Maybe they do find their way back, but then they mention something like, wow, I, you know, I really, I really had a problem getting back home. That's when we want the red lights. Mm -hmm. If somebody really gets lost driving to or from, um, that's when we need to take the keys. Mm -hmm. um, Going back to my uh, uh, friend's father, Finley, uh, he'd gotten lost a couple times, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he went around, and he says, well, where are my car keys? Mm -hmm. and he said, well, Dad, we had to take them. Mm -hmm. And he was very cooperative, and he said, oh, well, we'll see about that. Because <laughs> our cars represent a lot. Independence, mm -hmm. freedom, get up and go. Mm -hmm. I know I've got probably half of my group doesn't drive anymore. And they talk about the big loss. Mm -hmm. Well, some of that comes from mobility issues and, and uh, not so much forgetfulness. So um, we all have the tip of the tongue phenomenon. Um, I just had it a moment ago. Mm -hmm. Well, we all, we all have that. I just tell people, well, don't think about it, and it'll come up for you in a moment. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's when you see increased uh, forgetfulness or confusion uh, that then you may want to go and talk to your family physician. And they can uh, do a couple simple tests. One is a uh, mini mental uh, status exam. Um, one takes, it's a little bit more in depth, but it's not diagnostic, but it's called the MOCA. Uh, it's the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Uh, and um, that's what we use a lot at the hospital. And it, can, it really measures certain domains within the brain and uh, can indicate, well, you know, maybe this is more on the depression, you've been under a lot of stress, or it can indicate, well, we need more testing, and then to ask uh, the doctor for a referral to a neurologist who will then do a full uh, psych eval. So actually, if, if someone is listening this evening and they, Sharp Mesa Vista, may be able to help them with a senior intensive outpatient program that's three days a week, then would they just call the hospital like they were yeah. needing to assess this. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about an intervention, when do you intervene? Is it possible to engage the hospital? Well, if now we deal more in our outpatient part, we deal more with issues of mood, oh. depression, mm -hmm. anxiety, thoughts about suicide. Mm -hmm. um, um, half of my group has uh, bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it could be, I'm really concerned, I'm 
being more forgetful lately, well, they can come in and, and they can do a preliminary. Okay. Um, uh, part of it, a lot of what we see is some of this forgetfulness is really uh, because of mood issues. Mm -hmm. um, when people are depressed, they're more forgetful. Symptoms of depression, lack of concentration, lack of focus, loss of interest in daily activities, um, lack of motivation. I, I say it's not laziness. I just put it like this. You feel like you're get up and go, got up and went. That's because these mood issues are really energy vampires, as it were. So if they're mm -hmm. feeling like that, that 1-800 number at the end of that slide thing, you uh, they can give that, give that a call. So this idea, I, I want to go back to a little bit of this idea, the differentiating between depression and some form of dementia, the, lo the loss of, of memory. If, if we are too excited, we don't tend to remember things. If we're, we're, we're too anxious, we don't tend to remember right. things, is what, what I'm hearing you say. And so that can actually look like a form of dementia. So you could have a loved one who is suffering from depression, who the symptoms <clears throat> appear to be very similar to a lack of cognition, right. when it's more of anxiety or depression. And of course, anxiety and depression tend to coexist. Yeah. So that's what I'm hearing. So I've got two guys. I just had to discharge one guy because kind of being a, a Medicare provider, we have a scope of practice. It's clearly defined. Mm -hmm. And when somebody is clearly in the dementia phase, that moves out of our scope of practice, and then we look at providing referrals. So one gentleman was an appellate lawyer and um, very forgetful, but uh, I don't know, 10 years ago, he had a really bad uh, bout of depression mm. and very forgetful, absent-minded, loses his way and uh, closed his law practice for a few months, mm. got on top of his depression and was able to go back to work. This time, however, it was clearly after uh, some psych testing that really indicated that this was due to dementia. Mm. I have mm. another individual um, had uh, owned and operated his own bicycle shop for 40 years, uh, retired, closed that up, mm -hmm. and began to get very depressed and kind of anxious. And he, his get up and go, got up and went. He mm -hmm. doesn't have a lot of interest in things, very anxious. He shuffles along. Mm -hmm. He says, well, I'm getting older. I said, well, how old are you? And he goes, well, I'm... I'm 68. I go, well, that's not old. <laughs> you know, that's only a year older than me, and I'm not shuffling, so let's, you know. Um, so he went through a lot of the same psych testing, and what it's showing is not de a dementia, but this is probably due primarily to depression. So here we have two very different scenarios. Men... Uh, the, the lawyer was, I think, 74. Uh, this gentleman's 68. Mm -hmm. So we can really see that depression can really impact um, uh, the appearance of dementia. So if you have a loved one or yourself and maybe things have been getting you or your, your loved one down mm -hmm. and they start having problems of remembering or, or uh, um, kind of... Um, losing focus and where to go. Um, I, don't, I don't say, don't jump on the dementia bandwagon. Let's go and really get a good, clear diagnosis yes. of testing. It's really helpful, isn't it, what you're saying? And I wanted to spend a little bit of time on that uh, because one of the higher, which you and I are quite well aware of, one of the higher risk groups in America today are those in their middle to late 60s and above, particularly a white male. Very much. And so what you have is that if you do not have purpose, you know, they get up to go and want to go or have a reason. I mean, one of the first things that happens to me on vacation is I just came off vacation. I was going, what day is it today? 
And I rarely say that in my work. I kind of know the next day of the, the week, but there's a tendency when we, we don't have defined purpose, a vacation should be that works, maybe not defined purpose, is that we lose track of our focus and being able to concentrate even. So, and the other piece of that is, you could speak to us the best about this, Frank, is that um, one of the issues is when people say retire or they, they no longer have their current work, but yet they're able to volunteer and give to other people, there's a tendency to have a lot of get up and go because again, there is that, that purpose. Uh, I've come up with the, since working with seniors, I think that there are three important things, uh, purpose, meaning, and legacy. Mm. Um, and this is everything that retirement might take away from a person. Mm. So one of the gentlemen, um, he actually graduated out of my group last year. Um, but two times a week he would um, uh, volunteer for four hours each time at the uh, midway. And he was kind of on rust control of the planes and keep them in shape. And I said, well, what does that do for you? He goes, well, hmm. gives me some purpose. Gets me up in that morning. Hmm. Right? Hmm. And it has meaning because here's a piece of, of history. And then the legacy is, of course, this aircraft carrier is going to be sitting there for a long, long time. So for him, it gave him purpose, hmm. meaning, and legacy. Hmm. And I, I think that is something to be defined by each person. Um, I don't know that I would feel the same thing that he does to volunteer mm. at the Midway, mm. but I may find uh, greater purpose in doing something else. So I'm very big on um, encouraging people to do some volunteer work. Mm. Purpose, meaning, and legacy. Yeah. We all need that, don't we? Absolutely. That's a wonderful yeah. statement. Here's another question that, that ties into a little bit of this depression. And this question uh, was a text question. My dad lost his wife of 61 years about a year ago. Mm. He has gone to grief recovery 12-week group, but he's very depressed. He is trying to practice what he has learned. I think he also needs an antidepressant, but not sure how to approach him. Do you have a suggestion? <laughs> yeah, that's hard. Um, Married 61 years, so he's probably in his late 70s, early 80s. I have a gentleman that's come back to my group. Uh, his wife died uh, September of 2018. They had been married nearly 60 years, mm. so this mm. gentleman is 82 now. Mm. And I guess it's maybe exploring what do they, f number one, to normalize the sadness and even the degree of depression mm -hmm. felt at losing a partner of that many years. And uh, giving dad the freedom to feel that sadness mm. and to feel sad with them. And then also create a sense of the legacy that mom has left behind. Mm. So some of the fond memories. Um, not only fond memories, but you know, my my folks were married over 50 years, and there was a period, man, they, they fought like cats and dogs, mm. and separated a couple times, came back together, and um, when when uh, when my father died, my, my mother just really eulogized him. Oh, he was the love of my life in this. I was going, who are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I love my dad, but I know the hot water you guys went through. <laughs> So to remember the good and the pain in the neck times, I think it's okay to do that. And then to explore with dad, well, what is the quality of life that you want? Mm. And is, do you feel like the things that you've learned in the, in the grief group, which is terrific, is there a little bit more that maybe could be helpful? Well, I don't know. Well, you know, maybe, maybe some medication. Hmm. And a lot of people in that age group, there's either a lot of openness or a lot of non-openness about hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And 
And so I always phrase it, well, if you had diabetes, would you take insulin? Hmm. You know, if you had high blood pressure, I mean, uh, early 80s, there's got to be something he's taken something for it. I mean, I'm, I'm only in my 60s, and I'm on a couple of high blood pressure medications. Thank you very much, genetics. But mm. to look at, might there be, might it be worth a, a try? Now, a brief word about antidepressants. Uh, they take really to have full effect, take in that four to six week period mm. to really have full efficacy. And so it's, it's not like taking an aspirin. Some medications, you take them and, you know, within a day or two or even that day, they begin to work. Antidepressants are more cumulative. And so if you're able to convince dad, let him know that uh, um, it can take a little while to hang in there. Well, there's, yeah, but what about the side effects? Mm -hmm. What are the side effects of depression? which is worse. You know, I get side effects if I take an aspirin. So everything has side effects. Mm -hmm. It's looking at the pros and cons of mm -hmm. it, so. Okay. This next question helps us to kind of look to the future for all of us, I guess, and it, the question is, what is the best way to prepare our children to take care of us as we age? That's a really good question. Um, what, what is the best way? you know, to prepare our children to take care of us. That's assuming they want to take care of us. But I'm just saying that to take care of us as we age, I think that would be the desire of most of us if we love our children, of course, and they, they love us. What, what? Well, if you want to be in my will, no, I... <laughs> <laughs> That's a starting place, huh? Right, it's, it's the uh, gentleman who had bad hearing problems and he went to the doctor mm -hmm. and... Uh, the doctor said, oh, we got a brand new type of hearing aids. They're the best. They're, you, you, you'll hear a pin drop. Try these and come back in three weeks and we'll adjust and see what you think. Three weeks later, man comes back and the doctor says, well, how are they? He says, oh my goodness. He says, these are marvelous. I never knew I could hear so well. I can hear a pin drop in the room. He said, well, that's wonderful. He says, what do your family think about that? He says, oh, I didn't tell them. He says, you didn't? He said, no, I didn't. And I'll tell you another thing. I've changed my will three times. <laughs> <laughs> so how to, I had to get one joke in tonight. Yeah. Some um, of you don't know with Dr. Frank Ogle, he actually at the university where he teaches, he's taught at several, we met at Azusa Pacific University. We, we both have taught at uh, Point Loma Nazarene University in their graduate program as well. But the students love, if, if you really get to know Dr. Frank Ogle, they love his uh, jokes. That's what they'll say. They just, they just laugh and enjoy him. He really has quite the humor. If this psychology thing doesn't work out, maybe I can go to Comedy Central. I don't know. <laughs> I, in answer, seriousness. I know to you're this. still staying on the will here, you know, yes. the, the trust or whatever yes. it is. Let's, let's move past that if we can. <laughs> I think one of, maybe one of the good ways is to do some of the footwork yourself beforehand. Mm. Learn about the aging process. I think, you know, our culture is so uh, horribly misguided in terms of the aging process. And, and um, I think learning for yourself what might I expect and what are some of the resources and things that I can do. Other things of just... Um, talking, having an honest talk about um, final arrangements. Mm. Um, I get the, we do lectures every day uh, with themes and uh, one month each year we'll do transitions and I get the job of talking, you know, somebody will talk about the transition of losing a loved one. I get the job of talking about your death. Not your death, mm -hmm. but my death, your death. And one of the things that I, I uh, stress is you having a hand in making your, your arrangements, I think, and if you can include your family, they may be uncomfortable with it, but I think as you do it, you can bring a sense of relief and comfort to them. Mm -hmm. Like, 
you know, do, do you want certain songs at your funeral? Do you want certain scripture or hymns or pictures or, you know, maybe a favorite food out there? And, and so begin to incorporate the family that way. Uh, so that it's not a, a taboo or a fearful subject, but hey, this is just a natural part of life, and mm -hmm. I may need extra help, and here are some things that, that mm -hmm. can be available. Mm -hmm. my, my mother is 93 years of age. She's well. I talked to her this morning. She's just a dynamic person, has all of her cognition. But it's been 30 years she's been telling me that I'll be doing her funeral. And she's been talking about that for since she was in her 60s, I think. <laughs> she has it all planned out. She wants it to be a party. We, and, and so anyway, it's, it's been an ongoing discussion that we've had. She even mentioned it two weeks ago, I think, when I called her. Um, and so there's something about the idea that all of us are moving toward. We're all aging. So yes. to be very open, like one thing that you've demonstrated this evening, you've talked openly about your family. Yes. You've talked openly about your age. You've talked, you've talked openly about some of medications that are, I'm assuming, medications that you receive. Mm -hmm. And I think you're modeling really what we're talking about. You use the word freedom in emotion. You mm -hmm. use the word having freedom in your emotion. In other words, being aware of your own emotion, having freedom in that. We have about six minutes left, and I have, there's another question I'd like mm -hmm. for us to move into. So thank you for modeling actually being okay. transparent, and that's what you were talking about, mm -hmm. having a level of transparency with those we love. Um, and it's, it's difficult to have those conversations, isn't it? And I think that's why that question was raised, that last question. Here, this question, this will be our final question, but my siblings and I are caring for my parents. My dad is loving the care and the freedom it gives him. My mother, on the other hand, feels like we are trying to take over her life. Do you have suggestions on how to talk with her and have her understand we want to enhance her life and not take it over? I love what questions. So mom, you know, we're here to help out. What would it look like to you for us to be helping. Mm. What would that look like? So that gives her choice. Yeah. She has a level of, of choice. I don't want you to bug me at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is, is there a time when maybe we, you would like us to intervene or, mm. or to help? And, you know, I have one lady in my group. She, she has bipolar disorder. When she first came, she was very manic, and her doc daughter was trying to keep her from creating a little chaos and spending too much money, and mm. she was really upset at her daughter. Well, as her mood began to stabilize, she realized, oh, well, she was just trying to help me. Mm. And I, I think sometimes giving that, the power of that choice, well, what would that look like to you? Mm. You know, um, we're here, we're here for you, um, and we want to be available. Um, sounds like maybe you feel a bit um, smothered. So what would it look like for us to come in hmm. and help you? What would not being smothered look like for you? Mm -hmm. So really um, engage the mom and see what she might say. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking I, as we wind down here just a few minutes, is I was thinking of Dr. William C. Fisher, who was one of my heroes in the Church of the Nazarene, and he was at our table, my wife Robin, at our table, and he was really close to going to heaven. And his son was there and trying to help him to eat his meal, mm -hmm. and Dr. Fisher was going, he's well known in the Church of the Nazarene, he was, no, 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 and he, he could barely talk at that point, he, marvelous Christian evangelist well known around the world and he was wanting to individuate at one of his last meals that I was with him or had the privilege of being at the same table as him I great honoring him but that that idea of individuation being able to have your own, the ability to individuate even up to the time that you're passing on uh, to heaven is I think you're talking about individuation so having great respect for the other person trying to use open-ended questions let the other person be in charge and I still remember Byron his son 
who Byron Fisher, who backed off and smiled and said, "Okay, Dad," and he was his dad was wanting to have. A lot of individuation at that moment where he was losing his capacity to even feed himself at yeah. that point. Yeah. Um, so when we think about this, uh, this, this freedom um, of uh, allowing the other person to individuate um, in their life. Well, I know we have about two minutes left, and I want to thank you for uh, being here this evening. And uh, would you join me in thanking Dr. Frank Owell, our guest speaker this evening, for his presentation and helping us through this evening? Well, thank you. Thank you. And I just want to remind you that we do have, um, we have uh, actually freedom from the chains of addictive behavior. Uh, that is to be our next presentation here at Skyline Church. And my therapist says uh, that'll be our next presentation that's coming up, uh, and that's February 11. You can see that freedom from chains of addiction if you look on the screen. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we will uh, close out for this evening. Thank you again for attending. Father, we thank you. Thank you for the realization that our life really is not here. We are headed to another place, and that really is heaven. Uh, we, we can see that the aging process tells us and reminds us of the fact that really this is not our home. We are, we are moving through here and on uh, to heaven. And I still remember years ago, it's not that long ago, Dr. William, C. William Fisher, a great evangelist in the Church of the Nazarene, and I was in his living room and he said, well, uh, my, next, my next step, and he pointed up toward heaven, is to be in heaven. And it wasn't long thereafter that uh, he made his way to heaven by your grace. And we thank you for this evening, for the ability to be together and to talk about a very important issue, the caring of aging parents. So bless us, bless those who may hear this at a later date. We just give you praise for your presence and whose we are through and through Jesus Christ. We thank you, we bless you this night. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you again for attending My Therapist Says. Good evening to you. <laughs>